For loops. It's time to learn all about for loops. Now, these are a very essential thing for any programmer to know. So what is a for loop? Well, simply put, a for loop is a shortcut to run a block of code a certain number of times. So say you have four phone numbers, for example, and you want to add an area code to each of them. Well, instead of hard coding this four times, phone number one plus equals area code, phone number two plus equals area code, phone number three plus equals area code, etc., etc., you can just use a for loop and write out the logic one time to get the same job done in less lines of code. And for loops are very powerful in this regard because they scale quite well. So four phone numbers isn't that bad. You can write out phone number one, two, three, four plus equals area code pretty quickly. But now imagine instead of four phone numbers that you want to add area code to, imagine that you had 4,000 phone numbers. You can imagine how redundant it would be to have to write out phone number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way to 4,000 plus equals area code 4,000 times. So let's take a look at how we can use for loops to do amazing things like this. And we're going to do so by using two different languages, because I think it can be really helpful for you to see how they compare and contrast. And plus, you'll pretty much learn two languages at once. So on the left is the language C Sharp using the IDE Visual Studio, which should interest you if you're interested in doing Windows development or want to make games using a popular game engine called Unity. And on the right is the language Python 3 using the IDE Visual Studio code, which should interest you if you want to get into more general programming or data science. Alright, so here I have two brand new console projects, and if you don't know how to make a new console project in either C Sharp or Python or both, be sure to check out the video in the description. Uh, it's called how to install an IDE. And at the end of that video, I'll show you how to do that. All right, so for loops. For loops are extremely useful tools in programming. So let's jump into it, starting with some syntax. Now, the syntax for for loops in C Sharp can be a bit tricky to remember, but it's not terribly hard. You only have to remember these three things. But first, I'm going to remove these two lines because I don't need them. They come standard with every new console project in C Sharp. So we can just get rid of them. Uh, and this is what you have to remember. I'm going to write this in a comment just so that it's easier to remember. So a couple of forward slashes for that. And so first you write the word for and then parentheses. And now in these parentheses, this for loop happens in three steps. So let's segment it by adding two semicolons. And at last, the first thing you have to memorize is to initialize your variable. I'll just shorten this to initialize because we were going to quickly run out of room. And then the second thing you have to remember to do is to set your condition. And the final thing you have to do is give a command. So long as you remember these three things, for loops will be really easy for you to remember. So now let's walk through an example on how to initialize a for loop for real. I'm just gonna come down here to the next line and I'm gonna write out the word for. And then the first thing I need to do is initialize a variable. Now the most common variable that most people initialize at this step is actually an integer variable called i and you assign usually zero to it, but you can assign whatever you want to it. Actually, you can initialize any variable of any data type that you want here, but we'll come back to that in a bit. And so the next thing we have to add here is the condition, which simply just asks, how long do we want this for loop to run? And this condition here in this space is actually just expecting a Boolean. And so let's write a Boolean in here. Let's say that uh, we want to run so long as i is less than 10. Sounds good enough to us. And then the final thing we need to add is the command. And with the command, we simply just instruct our computer to do something. So if we initialize an integer named i and assign zero to it, and we're saying that we want this for loop to run so long as i is less than 10, then here we can say uh, we want i for every time the loop finishes to simply just add one. Using the increment operator, it just adds one to whatever variable we uh, added the increment operator to. And then at last, we just come down here and add our code block for the for loop. And now every single time that this loop goes through, it's going to run everything within the code blocks, which again is everything that we add within these two braces. And then at the end of it, it's just going to come back to the top. And then when it comes back to the top, it's simply going to check our condition here. It's going to ask, is I less than 10? If true, then it's going to exit here. It's no longer going to run 
this this loop anymore. It's going to go to whatever line is right after that. But if false, then it's going to do our command here. And then it's going to again run this block of code and continue that until when it checks here and this is false, then again, it's going to exit and run whatever line comes after the for loop. And so now to do a for loop in Python, it's actually a lot different. Python doesn't have this syntax where you initialize a variable and then you set a condition and then you give a command. It's actually, in fact, probably a lot more simpler, but the syntax for it goes as follows. First, you want to type out the word for, and then you want to type out I for I in, and then you need to define a range. And let's just say 10, we're gonna use the same 10. And then you write your colon here to start your code block. And then here you can put whatever commands you want in there. Now that's how you initialize a for loop in both C sharp and Python. However, I want to go back to the C sharp initialization real quick and point out something really interesting. Now, I think in most cases for for loops with this syntax, you'll find that most developers will first initialize an int called i and then assign it to be zero and then do like if int, if i is less than a certain number, then we're just going to use the increment op operator on it. But I want to relinquish your mind early in development because this right here is the actual rules for a for loop. But to understand where I'm about to go, uh, I think I need to first show you what's going on with a traditional for loop. So I'm going to do console dot right line here and then we're just going to print out the value of I. And then, of course, down here, I need to write a console dot uh, read key so that the terminal doesn't close on us as soon as we run it. I'm just going to come up here, hit the start button, and then I'm going to bring the console window over so you can see what we have going on here. Uh, so as you see, I is initialized um, and assigned to zero, and then we increment, increment, all the way until I is no longer less than 10, and then we exit out the for loop. Pretty simple. But again, here it says initialize. So we can initialize whatever we want, actually. This doesn't have to be an in. We can initialize a float if we want to. Run it again, and you can see that we have the same exact result. But why stop there? Instead of using the increment operator, we can do plus equals 0.5 if we want to. Hit the start just to show that result. And you see that we zero, then we increment plus five, and then another plus five, all the way to 9.5. And of course, that's not all. We can initialize a string if we want to and assign that to equal empty string. And then here, our condition as long as I, and then we can grab the length by hitting dot length of the string is less than 10, let's just say. Then we want to do I plus equals uh, let's say Z, for example, and then we can run this for loop here. Uh, start button, bring the window over, and we can see that it creates this interesting for loop. The sky's the limit, so long as you follow this convention right here. And because Python doesn't have the syntax, you can still achieve it, but you'd have to achieve it in other creative ways. Also, I didn't prove it to you that this works in Python, so I'll do that really fast. I'm going to do print and then I, and then I will run this by hitting the play button. You can see that it prints out all the digits in the range of 10. Now, that's pretty much how you go about using for loops. Now, as far as how you go about applying for loops, that's your own creative problem solving endeavor that I'll let you figure out on your own. However, I will leave you with one use case. So I went ahead and wrote out the program for our scenario because otherwise it would have been a long silence watching me type this out. But I'll walk you through it. But first, imagine that you've collected 700 files with a bunch of candy data on it. And now that you have this data, you need to get it all in one place. Now, you could open up one text file and manually add it to the other, then open up another text file and manually add it, and then next, and then add, and next, and add, but that's even exhausting for me just saying it verbally. You could instead write a program with a for loop to do this for you. And so first, we initialize a few variables. First one is a string array with all the file names on it. And then the next, we have the master data string, which we're going to compile all of our data to. And over in Python, we do the same exact thing. We initialize a string array called file name with 700 files that can fit on there. And then our master data string that will compile all of our data onto. 
And then we come down to our for loop in which we initialize an integer named i, assign zero to it, and then we have a condition here, which pretty much just says so long as i, which is the location in our for loop, as long as that is less than the amount of files that we have in the file name string array, then we want to continue looping. And then of course our command, we just want to uh, increment the integer i. And then down here in the code block, all of this is kind of fake. I just made it up for the scenario, but there is a huge assumption happening here. Uh, I'm assuming that you as the data collector, you are really good at naming your data files. And so every single data file that you have is named candy space data space and then whatever number of data file that is dot txt. Very important. Because if your data files are named something a bit more chaotic, then we lose the power to use a for loop on it. So let's just say that this is, you're really good at naming your files like this. Oh, and just to clarify, this dollar sign means that this string is interpolated. This is an interpolated string. If that's confusing, check out my string lesson. I go all in depth into it. But anywho, what we're doing here is we are taking the file name array at the element of i, which is where we're at in the loop, and then we're just going to assign this file name to that location or that element in the file name array. And then on the next line, I made a fake function here uh, where it takes in the name of the file name and it's supposed to read data, but down here it doesn't do anything but just return so like some string with the actual data name. But th this is a real function, it exists in a lot of libraries, but I, it's beyond the scope of this video. So just know that this, this, this right here represents something that really does happen. And so we pass the file name through the read data function. The read data function will open up the text file, read whatever is on there, and then we will add that to our master data string. And then over in Python, we do the same exact thing. We have a for loop here for i in range length of file name, uh, just to break apart what this means really quick. So length function, it returns the number of items in a container. Uh, and so this file name is a list with 700 items in it. So when we run length of file name, it's going and return 700 so for i in range of 700 will be our for loop and then we come on down into our code block and here again we have our file naming convention that we're just going to assume that you're good at labeling data uh, every file is named candy data and then whatever the number is uh, but it is, doesn't start at zero it starts at one so we have to add one to our i because i does start at zero txt and then we just assign that to our file name list at the element of i again that loops from 0 all the way to 700 uh, and that's going to match up because they're both using i's here and here and then finally we uh, made a fake function called read data it doesn't really do anything except for a return uh, candy data from and then whatever the name of the file is but we will run that function pass in the file name and let's say this was a real world scenario then this would open up whatever that text file is grab the data from that and then we would add that to our master data string and then finally we just come down here and then we'll print the master data and just to prove that these work i'm going to come up here and hit the start button c sharp and bring the window over and you can see that we have all this candy data Look at all that candy data. Wow. Then I'm come over here in Python and hit the play button and error. Oh, right, right. <laughs> uh, so Visual Studio Code has a really weird. Well, it's not weird. It's helpful. But if you have something selected and you hit the play button, then it's just going to run that. So I'm going to select nothing and then hit the play button. And there you go. You can see that it generates all that data. Wow. And yeah, there you have it. This is one creative use case in which for loops can be really helpful. But there are a ton of different for loop use cases, but it would take me all day to sit here and list out a bunch of different ones. But you now know how to write your own for loops. So now you can think of really interesting ways yourself to apply for loops. And that is everything that you need to know to get started with programming in regards to for loops.